Thank you for coming to Bioethics Grand Rounds. Um, I want to uh, uh, welcome you here on behalf of the Center for Christian Bioethics. Um, I'm Grace Wee. Um, I'm the Associate Director for the Center for Christian Bioethics. Dr. Gerald Winslow is our Director for the Christian for Center of Bioethics. <laughs> Um, so today we are very honored to have with us Dr. Jukes Nam, who's going to be giving our, our grand talk, our grand rounds um, uh, talk today. Um, Dr. Nam, if you've had the pleasure of um, working with him, it's not only a fantastic physician, um, wonderful thinker, empathetic physician, um, and just a great person uh, to be around with. Um, I've known Dr. Nam for quite a long time. Um, he and his wife uh, went to medical school here. Um, his wife Eileen was actually a pediatric resident alongside, uh, alongside me. Um, and uh, just having friends in common and, and uh, coming up through the Loma Linda system, um, I've always um, had such a good working relationship with, with Dr. Nam. And after finishing medical school here, um, he did a surgical residency um, and then did a fellowship in surgical oncology and on, um, on the way through found time to also take the clinical ethics course at uh, University of Chicago McLean um, School. Um, and so um, I do remember when Dr. Nam was coming back here uh, we were heard he was coming back as an attending. Um, I was very excited uh, to be able to have Dr. Nam come and work as part of our clinical ethics team. Currently, Dr. Nam is not only part of our clinical ethics team as a clinical ethicist, he's also the program director for the surgery residency program and um, assistant professor of surgery. Um, and But again, more importantly, not only a dedicated physician, but also a believing, a true, um, a, a, a devout believer um, in, in God. And, um, and I know that he is able to uh, bring comfort to many of his patients. Um, he is father to three children. Ian, Ella, and Audra, and still finds time in his busy schedule to actually coach basketball and soccer for his kids' mm -hmm. team. So I need to take lessons from you, <laughs> Dr. Nam, and time management. <laughs> we want to welcome uh, Dr. Nam. He, after speaking, he's going to be um, setting aside some time for questions. And so if you have questions, please make sure um, to have them ready. And I know he's looking forward to a good discussion. So without any further ado, Dr. Nam. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wee, for that generous introduction. Um, can you guys all hear me OK? So I want to welcome uh, you all to Bioethics Grand Rounds. It is a huge honor for me to be here. I remember as a medical student, um, you know, seeing just wonderful speakers um, and deep thinkers sharing on this platform. And to be invited by Dr. Winslow and Dr. Wee to um, share with you today is a huge privilege. And um, I'm, re I'm really honored uh, to be here. And I thank you all for being here as well. So um, as Grace mentioned, um, I am a surgeon and an ethicist. And so um, you, know, you might think that is kind of a little at odds, uh, maybe a potential conflict. Um, but I can assure you that um, you know, some of us surgeons do have some you know, ethical uh, beliefs, and we try to take care of our patients in the best way possible. I don't have any financial disclosures. Um, and today, I just wanted to talk to you um, on a topic that is really near and dear to my heart, um, specifically as a surgeon, as an ethicist, and also as a, as a medical uh, researcher. And that is um, the topic of medical innovation and the ethical framework uh, behind that. So this afternoon, I want to really underline three main objectives. Number one is we're going to take a little trip down uh, to revisit the historical perspectives that underlie medical ethics, um, medical research ethics, as well as innovation. And then look at the similarities and differences between medical research and medical innovation. And hopefully um, apply an ethical framework with how we should best approach uh, medical innovation in our practice here and now. 
So um, before I get going, how many of you here are physicians? Yes, a few. How many are researchers? Okay, good. How many other are support staff nursing or ancillary staff? Very good. Students? Quite a few students. All right, excellent. And then others? Yes, okay, good. And other ethicists, bioethicists, perfect, very good. So we have a very diverse group here, and I think um, hopefully there's, there's something for everyone to, to learn. And at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions and have a discussion um, regarding uh, this presentation. So first of all, I want to talk about medical research. And so and clearly define what the purpose of medical research is. And according to the Declaration of Helsinki, which I'll get into later, the primary purpose of medical research is not to necessarily benefit the individual patient, but it's to understand the causes, development, effects of diseases, improve preventive, diagnostic, and therapeutic uh, interventions in order to generate new knowledge that will potentially help other patients down the road. However, ethically, this goal of generating new knowledge should not and cannot take precedence over the rights and interests of individual research subjects. And as we'll learn shortly, this um, unfortunately has happened on numerous occasions. Um, and that's why it's so important to set up an ethical framework um, in terms of research. And the responsibility of protecting patients in research always rests with the physician or the allied health professional and or the researcher. It cannot and should not rest on the subject or the patient to try to protect themselves. So if we go back kind of on the timeline of major uh, major events in, in research ethics. We go all the way back to 500 BC in the Hippocratic Oath, with which all of the physicians in this room have, um, are very familiar with, maybe even recited at some point in their career. But the underlying um, principle of the Hippocratic Oath is really to do what's in the best interest of the patient and first do no harm for the patient. And then we'll talk about the Nuremberg Code in 1947 in Nazi Germany. We'll talk about the Helsinki Declaration. And then eventually, in 1966, the US federal uh, government uh, codified the requirements uh, for human subjects research. But the Hippocratic Oath, even before there was actual medical research, Hippocrates wrote, I will apply dietetic measures for the benefit of the sick according to my ability and judgment. I will keep them from harm and injustice. And for hundreds of years, physicians have followed this principle, at least in Western civilization, although there's evidence that even in Eastern civilization, there are similar codes that physicians were held to. However, it wasn't until 1947, and actually in World War II, when the atrocities of Nazi Germany were discovered with the human experimentation that went on in the concentration camps, and the doctor's trial that subsequently followed in 1946, the world was painfully made aware that Doctors did not always have the best interest of individuals um, in mind. And in this trial, there were 23 physicians under the Nazi regime who were placed on trial. And their defense, they said, well, we know about, we know about the Hippocratic Oath, but we were trying to benefit society, not necessarily individual patient. And so we thought we were doing what was right. However, as we know, that argument did not hold. And in 1947, the Nuremberg Code was established, 
which stated two main ethical principles. Number one, that for medical research, informed consent is mandatory. Patients must voluntarily um, take part in medical research. And the second is that it is the responsibility of the researcher or the physician to make sure that the risk-benefit ratio is favorable and there is not going to be undue harm placed on the patients. And in that trial, 15 physicians were found guilty. Many of them were sentenced to death. But the crimes they committed in the name of science included experiments placing patients in conditions similar to high altitude where they were placed in low pressure systems and patients were essentially had warm autopsies performed on them and they found, you know, examined the brain and found gas bubbles in the blood vessels in the brain. They performed freezing experiments where patients went, underwent hypothermia down to 79 degrees Fahrenheit and were tried to rapidly um, be rewarmed. They underwent experiments looking at tuberculosis where they, they purposefully infected patients with a tuberculosis um, bacteria. They even did bone, muscle, and joint transplantation, um, which was largely unsuccessful um, and resulted in considerable morbidity and death uh, and suffering of many of these patients. But they did this all in the name of research, and they thought that they were justified. And so after the Nuremberg Code, the World Medical Association got together and put together in 1964 the Declaration of Helsinki. And basically, it stated that if clinicians are to perform research, there needs to be an independent review to make sure that patient safety, subject safety is ensured. And again, they said that the concern for the individual subject must always prevail over the interest of society and science. And again, reinforcing the importance of informed consent. However, even after the Declaration of Helsinki, the medical field did not learn its lesson. In 1966, in a landmark article in the New England Journal of Medicine, Henry Beecher a professor of anesthesia at the Harvard Medical School published a paper. And in this paper, without naming any names, he listed 22 research studies that were published in leading medical journals from prestigious academic centers that he considered were unethical. And most of these studies were considered unethical because there was a clear lack of informed consent for these patients. And this obviously created quite the controversy and the uproar. But this eventually led to a federal law that codified the importance of informed consent of these patients for the third time. And even after this publication, it didn't resolve all the controversies in research ethics. The Declaration of Helsinki was revised multiple times, um, but it did bring awareness to the public and to the medical field that even in Western civilization, even in the United States of America, questionable research practices could still happen and even be rewarded in a way um, and that we need to be very, very careful and pay close attention to the ethics surrounding medical research. So 1979, as a response to Beecher's paper, the Surgeon General issued a statement saying that um, protection of human subjects in clinical research is important and again, Informed consent is, um, is very, very important. And the Belmont Report um, um, was a, was, um, 
carried out. And just before the Bel Belmont report was another atrocity that really stains the history of the United States of America. And this is one that many of you are probably very well aware of, and that is the Tuskegee syphilis study. This is a study that started even before the Nuremberg trials. It started back in 1932. And it was supported by the United States government, by the Public Health Service. And essentially, they monitored um, African American men with syphilis, and they gave them treatments, which were in, in a sense placebos, and monitored progression of advanced syphilis. Now when the study was started, it was probably ethically acceptable because there really was no treatment or cure known at that time for syphilis. However, in 1947, penicillin was discovered and was found to be very active and effective against syphilis infections. However, the, the Public Health Service instructed the physicians and researchers not to treat the people enrolled in this trial, but to continue to give them placebos and to document the outcomes of uh, advanced stages of syphilis. And as a result, numerous men died from syphilis. Forty wives contracted the disease from their husband, and 19 children were born with congenital syphilis because they did not have access to therapeutic drugs. And the, the study would have continued on had it not been for a whistleblower in 1972 who decided to publish a piece and make the public aware of what was happening. And there was public outrage. And as a result, the United States government was in a panic. The, um, the research medical field was kind of grasping for you know, where they were um, ethically. And again, arguably, this was the most infamous biomedical research study in US history. And based on the Belmont report, again, they stressed the importance of informed consent in medical research. They stress the importance of a favorable risk-benefit ratio for patients undergoing um, medical research. And also highlighted the care for vulnerable populations. And in 1997, the good clinical practice document was, um, was published was called the, the harmonization document. Because many different countries, many different continents had their own kind of ethical research principles and it was decided to put it all together so that globally they could all be one document that they could all reference. And that was just a little over 20 years ago. However, in that time span, a lot has changed in medicine. And with these stark history lessons, you know, we can look back and think that we hold the moral high ground compared to our predecessors. However, the danger that we face, specifically that our patients face, is that we may allow medical technology and innovation to outpace the ethical framework to keep that in check and to keep our patients safe. There is a huge imbalance of personal rewards at the potential cost of patient safety. And like an unstable financial market, an ethical bubble is waiting to burst. And in order to prevent the collapse of society's trust in our medical system, I believe that it is an ethical challenge facing our generation to ensure 
that we have an appropriate ethical framework for research going forward. Now, there's another thing that kind of muddies the, the waters here, and that is medical innovation. Or since I'm a surgeon, I'm going to be referring to kind of examples of surgical innovation. And surgical innovation or medical innovation is a little bit unique because it's not really standard of care, but it's not really research either. For example, when I'm taking a patient to the operating room and let's say I'm going to remove an appendix for appendicitis, there's many different ways that one can go about doing that. And predominantly we do it laparoscopically and make three small incisions, put a camera inside and put instruments inside. But some people do it with just, can do it with just one incision. Some people do it with two, some people with three. Some people put incisions kind of at the upper abdomen, some people put in the lower abdomen. Some people resect the appendix with suture. Some people use a stapler. Some people use an energy device. And so it's not really research but it's not really the same type of therapy either. And so in terms of medical innovation, laparoscopy has really changed the face of surgery. It has really been a huge advance, but it hasn't come without cost. And so in 1985 was the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy done by Eric Muhe, he's a German, and actually, at the time, it was not very well received, and um, he was very, very disappointed. But it wasn't until a couple years later that it started gaining popularity in France and then eventually into the United States in 1987. And surgeons and patients both were just enamored by this procedure. When in the past, a huge incision was made below the, the rib cage on the right, be very, very painful, cutting through muscle. And patients would stay in the hospital like you know four or five days um, with pain control, waiting for their bowels to start working. However, with the advent of laparoscopic surgery and three or, false, three or four small incisions, patients were able to go home the next day or maybe two days at the most. And this radically changed um, the, the way that um, gallbladder disease was treated. And so quickly, there was a rise in the number of cholecystectomies being done, most of them being done laparoscopically. And many, many surgeons started adopting, the, adopting this. And it wasn't until many, many years later, 1991, that the New, the New York State uh, Department of Health looked at the results from lap coles. They looked at the registry, and alarmingly, they found that there is a 15 times higher chance of complications, of injuries, to the bile duct with the laparoscopic approach, especially in surgeons who haven't done um, that many of these procedures. And when this was published, the American College of Surgeons put a moratorium on laparoscopic cholecystectomies, and they said, we can't continue in this path. And they said that hospitals and surgeons need to focus their attention on training the appropriate way, educating, proctoring, credentialing, and improving outcomes for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And it was a difficult lesson to learn um, because this was not research. This was a brand new innovation that surgeons thought it was obvious, it's helping patients. So we don't need to research this. But eventually, that hard lesson that the surgeons faced, it was ultimately the patients who had to pay the price. But after education and appropriate training, now I'm glad to say that lap coli is a standard of care and complications are extremely low, even less than um, open technique. And 
this has really changed the way that we perform surgery, not only for the gallbladder, but other areas of the body as well. But now, surgery continues to evolve, continues to innovate. And now, instead of laparoscopic instruments, we have robotic platforms. We have robots that can do even finer, delicate movements, that can be even more precise um, in cases. And in 2000, the first robotic prostatectomy was performed. And at that time, there were 1,000 robotic cases done in the year 2000. However, in 2018, less than 20 years later, there is a thousand-fold increase in the number of robotic cases that are being done annually. And it makes sense. There are benefits to robotic surgery. Number one is the ergonomics for the surgeon. But it does come at a price, not only financially, but we don't know if robotic surgery is actually beneficial for patients long term. There are some studies showing that maybe they could have less pain, but there's no studies out there, there's no data showing that robotic surgery is any better than laparoscopic surgery in any patient outcome. <coughs> so in this era of medical innovation, I would say we have to be careful because newer is not always better. And I know a lot of my friends, maybe a lot of you, kind of rush out to buy the newest iPhone or the newest gadget, thinking that it's going to be better than the last. Um, but those of you who follow the news know that um, the new app that they used in Iowa wasn't necessarily a, a great hit. Right? And, and their problem was that they admit it wasn't properly tested. Right? And so I think we can learn a lesson from that. Um, in medical innovation as well. So medical innovation, the definition is an unproven or innovative therapy that is defined as a new or modified therapy that a clinician may deem to be in the best interest of the patient without adequate data to support patient benefit or safety. So when we compare research versus innovation, they both are a departure from standard practice, from standard of care. And you can argue that the risks and benefits are largely unknown for both research and innovation. The obligation still remains by the clinician and the researcher to protect the patient at all costs. However, this is where the, the roads kind of diverge from research and innovation. So where research aim is to benefit society, when a clinician uses innovative therapies, the goal really is to hopefully benefit the individual patient. Whereas research has regulatory oversight, such as the IRB, such as the Data Safety Monitoring Board for clinical trials, in innovation, there really is lack of oversight. When I operate, I can pick this suture or that suture, I can pick this stapler or that stapler, and no one is watching my shoulder you know, looking over my shoulder and saying, you know, you should use this or you shouldn't use that. However, with research, there are downsides in that with all the regulatory oversight, it is very cumbersome. And it takes a long time to make significant advances and to gain knowledge. And it can take a considerable number of patients or subjects in order to do that. Whereas innovation, Without the regulatory oversight, done well and done ethically, you can have very rapid advances, as we saw in the field of surgery with laparoscopic surgery. And you can really go and benefit patients in a very real and positive way. In research, in order to enroll subjects in research, we have to have what's called equipoise, clinical equipoise, which means as a clinician or researcher, we don't really know which is going to be better, the standard of care or the research intervention, in order to ethically enroll patients in the trial. However, in innovation, we have something called innovation bias. And the clinician already has a preconceived bias or notion that I think what I'm going to try on this patient is going to help this patient, despite 
having absolutely no data um, that's, uh, that shows whether or not this, this um, intervention is going to be harmful or beneficial. In research, there's obviously conflict of interest. But I'll argue that in innovation, there is even more susceptibility to conflict of interest because of the lack of oversight, because of the ability to advance your career professionally or personally with these innovations. For research, informed consent is required by law. It has to be voluntary. However, in medical innovation and in surgical innovation specifically, it saddens, me, it saddens me to say that informed consent is, is inconsistent at best. And many clinicians may not lay out what is at stake for the patients when innovative therapies or procedures are undertaken. And there's a cost to research, but largely those costs are absorbed by the clinical trial or the study. However, in innovation, we must be very careful because a lot of that cost is placed upon the patient. And so going back to innovation and newer is better, it reminds me of a story that my mentor, Peter Angelos, shared. He's an endocrine surgeon um, at the University of Chicago and one of the leading surgical ethicists in the country. But he, at one point in his career, started um, the path towards getting credentialed in robotic surgery. And as endocrine surgeon, he does adrenal surgery, but also mostly thyroid surgery. And so he was looking at robotic thyroidectomies. Instead of a scar here in the neck, surgeons put a small incision in the armpit, and they can use a robot to tunnel underneath the skin and remove the thyroid in that way, so you have scarless surgery. And he went through all the training, and he went through all the credentialing, and he went through all the proctoring, as a, a good ethical surgeon should. And then he decided he was ready for his first patient. And so he was thinking, how am I going to tell this patient that, that this is my first one, you know? <laughs> and so he was like, well, you know, it's, I, ethically I need to you know, inform them, right? And so he decided, you know, I'm just going to tell them. And so it was this young lady. And he was talking about the risks and the benefits of the surgery. And he said, you know what? There's this new technique. It's called robotic surgery. Instead of a incision here, we can go through the armpits. And um, I just wanted to let you know that you will be my first patient. And the patient, to his surprise, said, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> And this, there's this public perception that's, again, that newer is better, right? And that we as doctors know what we're doing and that, of course, we have their best interest in mind. And so, again, we as clinicians, as researchers, we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard because to the layperson, they may not realize what they are getting themselves into. So in terms of ethical framework, you know, in clinical ethics, we really the, the main kind of established model is the four box model, looking at medical indications, patient preferences, quality of life, contextual features. And it really relies on kind of the, the main pillars of ethical um, uh, principles, which are beneficence, patient benefit, non maleficence, first do no harm, the importance of respect for autonomy, and in this case, informed consent plays a large role in that. And then also contextual features in surgical and medical innovation that involves conflict of interest. And again, I think it's important that when undergoing innovative procedures or therapies, that patients are aware of the potential conflicts that we as clinicians and researchers maybe um, succumbing ourselves to. And in medical innovation, there are pressures. There's pressures from industry to use newer devices, 
newer procedures. There's pressure from the academic side in terms of pathways to promotion, publications. And there's also personal um, um, pressures as well in terms of personal kind of uh, fulfillment and personal um, esteem and regard with, amongst your peers. So there actually is mention of how to approach medical innovation from the Declaration of Helsinki. And they acknowledge that there are circumstances where medical innovation may be necessary and may even potentially be helpful to patients outside of a research study. And those are situations where in a treatment of an individual patient, there may be no proven interventions that are effective. And after informed consent from the patient, the physician may proceed using an unproven intervention if, according to the physician's judgment, it may offer hope to saving that person's life, reestablishing health, or alleviating suffering. However, they go on further. They say, you can't stop there. But subsequently, this intervention, if continued, should be made the object of standard official research designed to evaluate its safety and efficacy. And in all those cases, it is ethically imperative that the information, the data be recorded, published, so that others can learn and not make the same mistakes or also benefit from the, um, the outcomes of these innovative procedures. But I would say we seek innovation in order to better care for our patients. And we want to achieve better outcomes for our patients, our institution. However, we have to be careful that if in the process of innovation, if we lose our patient's trust, if we lose society's trust, then really we have lost everything. The atrocities of Nazi Germany, the atrocities of the Tuskegee experiment have left huge wounds in large population of people. And there's still huge mistrust in the medical system because of those atrocities. And I would say that quote from Carlos Pellegrini, who is the former president of the American College of Surgeons, he says that's talking about the patient-physician relationship. And he says that trust is the keystone of the patient-physician relationship. And it is an indispensable virtue of a good physician. And without this virtue, the relationship disintegrates, just as what happens to an arch when the keystone is removed. But with it, we enhance our ability to heal the body and the soul of the patient, the physician, and the patient care team. And so in summary, medical innovation is distinct from medical research. And although it lacks the regulatory oversight as required in research, it is our ethical duty to make sure that we keep the patient's best interest in mind. And that includes adequate informed consent for innovative procedures where risks and benefits may be unknown. And if they're unknown, we need to disclose that to the patients. In addition, we need to be able to disclose potential conflicts of interest in terms of personal gain, academic um, uh, gain, conflicts that we may be um, subconsciously um, uh, driving uh, our desire for innovation. And I think it's important that the outcomes of innovative therapies be tracked um, either national or institutional databases so that it can be studied, uh, so that it can, negative consequences can be discovered early on, um, hopefully not you know, five years like it was for laparoscopic cholecystectomies. And eventually, innovative therapy should be systematically studied um, 
and those outcomes disseminated, whether positive or negative, uh, in results. And finally, continuous advances in medicine rely on the public's trust of the medical profession, of the research profession, and it is important that we as clinicians maintain uh, the patient's trust in us. I want to thank you for your attention. Um, at this time, I'll be happy to take any questions that uh, uh, you may have uh, at this time, or any comments from the floor. I want to thank you for really talking about this important subject. I feel like uh, the first time I remember really talking about it um, in depth um, with you was regarding a case mm -hmm. where we, um, uh, in order to treat a patient who had severe bronchospasm, uh, we actually brought uh, equipment that is normally in the operating room. Um, inhalational gas given by anesthesia actually up into the ICU, which is uh, something that was very new and pretty innovative for us. And then now we were prolonging therapy beyond what was published. Um, so this goes to informed consent, because obviously this sort of in medical innov innovation, um, it could be stepwise, like described by your mentor um, in, um, when he learned a new robotic technique. Um, but it also can be, especially in the ICU, it can be very sudden. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we actually get informed consent when the other option is either certain death mm -hmm. or maybe a, even the use of a worse tech, um, uh, technology? Um, and then also, are you supposed to get ongoing consent? I mean, what is the the duty of the clinician now that you are continuing the therapy beyond, say, what has been published? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. And so um, uh, to answer your first question, I think a lot of innovation, you know, we, we know that necessity is the mother of invention, right? And so a lot of innovation happens in the ICU in critical care situations. Um, and I would say that um, in the ethical, ethics literature, there is really a sliding scale in terms of the requirements, the ethical requirements for informed consent. And that sliding scale is inversely proportional to how life-threatening the condition is, right? So if your other option is death, then I would say the informed consent process does not have to be as in-depth, right, or, or ongoing, right? However, it is directly proportional to how risky the procedure is, right? And so if there are inherent risks of significant morbidity or even death with uh, intervention, then I think that discussion needs to be a little bit more um, detailed and in depth. And, and also you have to take into account individual patient preferences, right? Some of my patients, when I discuss surgery with them, they say, you know what? You don't have to tell me anything. I trust you, right? And I say, but let me just tell you, you know, so I feel better about myself. And they're like, you know, I, it's okay, I trust you, you know? Whereas other patients will say, have a list of questions, <laughs> maybe a couple pages worth, and I have to go through one by one and answer all of them. But I would say overall, I think, you know, in, in cases of where death is the kind of um, likely outcome if we don't do anything, then these are areas where, you know, innovation can potentially um, um, be um, safer to do, kind of, ethically, um, but also um, potentially, you know, benefit patients um, in, in the long run. But, you know, obviously not, you know, we have to disclose to patients that in situations like that with these therapies, we don't know that it's going to benefit them or not. And so I think we have to be very clear uh, with that when we're just discussing that with patients. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes. You touch <clears throat> briefly on practice variation. When within a department there's wide variation in mm -hmm. practice, you've mentioned you know, how many incisions for, a, for an appendectomy. Mm -hmm. What duty do you have to disclose that I'm a four puncture person <laughs> or a single puncture person? Yeah. And what duty does the department have to look at the effect of this practice variation on outcomes? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And 
I think there is no clear consensus, you know, on that. I think we have kind of a standard of care, at least in surgery, um, and there is wide variation. And there's some people that do kind of single incision surgery, and there's other surgeons that don't do any laparoscopic surgery, they do all their surgeries open. And so there, are they ethically obligated to, you know, tell their patients, you know what, you have this option, you know, there's robotic surgery that I don't do, but, you know, I'm happy to refer you to someone who does. Um, and some would say, you know, maybe. And others would say, you know what, in my hands, the way I do it is the best for the patient. And so ethically, I feel, you know, my conscience is, is appeased. And so, um, you know, I think there is no clear cut answer for that. But I think it is a responsibility of departments, institutions to monitor that and see if there are any, you know, untoward side effects or more complications and, and address that um, in, in, a, in a regular manner. Yeah. Thank you. Let me see if I can form a question that's uh, built on what was just said. Uh, many of us have heard uh, physician executive Brent James from Intermountain, who has been a champion of more standardization, mm -hmm. give his talk about there, ca there can't be a dozen equally safe and effective ways to do an appendectomy. Mm -hmm. And in today's world where you can look at very large numbers, thanks to electronic records, they create a cookbook, he says, that starts by asking the best expert the best panel of experts you can find to create the cookbook. Mm -hmm. And then you can vary from the cookbook, but we'll keep score mm -hmm. to see whether you do better or worse. If you do better, we'll change the cookbook. Mm -hmm. If you do worse, we'll ask you to change. Mm -hmm. I, I've been in groups that hear that sort of thing and say, well, that's kind of, that really is cookbook medicine and mm -hmm. takes all the fun out of, of the practice. Mm -hmm. Your response to that, I, I think it's really kind of just similar to the previous question. Yeah, I think so. It depends on what your, your out, your, overall outcomes and goals are. And so I think if you are looking to really study a specific technique or procedure or therapy, then you have to standardize it, right? Otherwise, you have nothing to, there's no control to kind of measure it with, right? And so if you want, so in process improvement, quality improvement, there has to be a standard. Um, however, and that would potentially benefit future patients down the road, right? But if you are primarily focused on your patient right now in front of you, and you say, again, the best technique that I know how to do, and in my hands, is this technique. It's not this cookbook technique that they're telling me to do. And so you kind of have this you know, tug in both directions. Are you trying to help society or try to help the institution learn in research, or are you trying to help your individual patient? And so that's the struggle between the clinician and the researcher. That's why the Declaration of Helsinki, they kind of specifically mentioned that. Can you be a true clinician and enroll your patients in research at the same time? Because you have this, this dyad, this pull in different directions. Yes. Just to, to expand on Dr. Winslow's comment, mm -hmm. There is a lot of effort being done to retrospectively look at practice patterns, find out which is the most economic, and then impose that practice mm -hmm. pattern mm -hmm. on the physician. Yeah. I would assert that that is unethical because that practice pattern has not been proven to be superior for that patient. Mm -hmm. This is almost always done without prospective studies to confirm that this is the best therapy. It's often the most financially beneficial therapy for the institution, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's not been validated to be the best therapy for the patient. Yes, and I would agree with that. And we're, all, we're constantly gonna have this ethical dilemma in terms of you know, cost. And you know, there's a value-based medicine is a big buzzword uh, now. And I think that's part of you know, ethics is addressing cost concerns and benefit to society, uh, justice overall. However, you know, rationing at the bedside, so to speak, is, is, a, is a slippery slope. Um, I would say that, I don't have a good answer for that, but I would say all the more reason for us as physicians, as clinicians, to take ownership of our practices and keep track of our practices and monitor it ourselves. Because if we don't, then the government or some other organization or agency is gonna do it for us. And so I think that's why we have to make sure that we ensure that the public and society's trust in us is not compromised. 
and that we you know, let them know that we are doing everything that we can to make sure that we are keeping track of things and doing what's in their best interest. Right? Jukes, it sounds like that then, and I see Hanover Harrell come up, but mm -hmm. it sounds like then that there are a lot of institutional duties that a place would have to have if they want to support medical innovation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you have the clinician who wants to do innovative medical work, yeah. but then there has to be this entire support system. Yes. I mean, who's going to keep track of the numbers? Who's going to actually look at the protocols yeah. um, in order to support that one clinician who says, hey, I just read about the study, this observational study, and now I'm going to give high dose vitamin C and thiamine to all my patients in sepsis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, if you go back in history, another huge surgical innovation was solid organ transplantation, right? That didn't just happen overnight. Um, and huge, you know, we know that's a huge benefit, saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, however, you know, it, you know, addressing your comments, institutions had to make sure that they had the resources available in order to start a transplant program. You can't just have one surgeon saying, you know what, technically I know how to sew in a liver perfectly because it takes more than that, right? And so in terms of medical innovation, surgical innovation, you know, whether it's inhaled you know, sevoflurane, you have to have buy-in from anesthesia, and you have to have the equipment necessary. You have to have someone there at the bedside kind of monitoring uh, the patients 24 hours a day. And so you really need to have, it's our ethical duty to before we embark on these innovative procedures that we have done our homework and we have laid the groundwork so that it can be analyzed, it can be um, studied, and, it, and that the information can be used to benefit patients uh, down the road or, or prevent harm to future patients. So you point out a lot of this um, medical innovation, lack of regulatory oversight. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee more oversight coming and kind of what does that look like or is that wanted? Mm -hmm. um, and, like laws or education or awareness, mm -hmm. um, what, what do you kind of see in the works there? Yeah, so I think it, overall the medical profession tries to distance itself from federal law as much as possible because we know once you know, the, federal law, the you know, federal government gets involved and things just halt, you know, to slow to a halt really and you can't get anything done. Um, but I think professional organizations like the American College of Surgeons, uh, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Society of University Surgeons, they have actually, and you know, the American Medical Association also, have, have made consensus guidelines in how surgical innovation or medical innovation should be done um, and how, you know, you know, what steps are needed in order for it to be done ethically. And so there are steps in the right direction uh, to do that. Now, whether institutions are following those guidelines or not, that's another story. Um, but those guidelines are out there, and really they outline kind of essentially this, you know, this summary slide, the importance of you know, making sure that there is kind of good medical background and support for this innovative therapy that you're doing, that you are you know, providing adequate informed consent, that um, you think that there's going to be a favorable risk-benefit ratio for the patient, and that it'll be tracked you know, somewhat either institutionally. There are national databases that you can you know, you can submit your data to, especially in robotic surgery. And, and I think they've learned a lesson from the Lap Coley um, experience. And so the industry that actually makes the robotic platform, they are very, very interested and involved in keeping track of all the outcomes um, so that, um, you know, harm doesn't come up, uh, upon patients that, that undergo robotic surgery. And so it is being done. However, it, there's nothing to stop a, a rogue surgeon or a clinician from doing his or her own thing. Um, as, aside from the department structure, the hospital structure in and of itself to ensure that ultimately we're taking care of patients. Question over here and then a couple over there. I'm currently working with one of our medical bioethics students on basically it's informed consent, but it also looks very heavily at the very tenuous relationship between information and decision making, which would be 
consent in this case. And often the more information you have uh, in a variety of ways, including medical, even simple medical decisions, a lot of times more information actually results in worse decisions. And we also know that uh, how people actually make decisions is not on the basis of rational information, that until the click happens that's very subjective, uh, people don't make decisions. They can't make decisions. The brain doesn't work that way. Um, guess, Curious, when you do try to do informed consent, it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about here is you know, make sure the patient has the information, but do you believe, how, a lot of what you ended up then talking about is, you know, do they trust their physician, which mm -hmm. may be um, a far, far more important than is the information gonna help them? How do you understand the information or the link between information and consent and how does that impact how you talk to your patients? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, there's robust literature showing that in surgical informed consent, patients, if you ask them five, 10 minutes after the discussion, they only retain maybe less than 50% of the information that, that you just uh, discussed with them. And in my experience, a lot of times when I'm talking to patients about surgery or procedures or, or therapies, I can tell most of the time they're not really listening to the words that are coming out of my mouth. They're looking at my eyes and they're seeing, you know, is he, does he, you know, is he trustworthy? Does he seem optimistic that this is going to work? Does he kind of, is he trying to hide something? And, um, and that's the reality. And I think um, in the Declaration of Helsinki, when it talks about surgical innovation or medical innovation, it says very clearly it relies on the physician's judgment, whether or not he or she thinks it's going to be helpful or effective or indicated in that situation. And so no matter what ethical framework you put around this, it still relies on physicians' judgment. And so how do we teach physicians you know, good judgment? How do we teach them to be ethical, virtuous kind of clinicians? That's another topic to, 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 yeah, to go into um, that'll take up much more time than we have. But um, I think you know, in terms of the informed consent, issue, that is, a, that is a real issue um, because, um, and ultimately, I think it does just come down to trust. Um, the more information you give, the more likely people are to make decisions on basically what we call, what we call SIFs, seemingly irrelevant factors. Yeah, yeah, yep, absolutely. I saw um, one other hand over here. No? Wonderful. Look at this, stroke of one o'clock. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you again, Dr. Nam. Let's Thank give him you. a round Thank of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you.